Okay, like I said, captions are already on. That's the little CC button in the corner. Um, and housekeeping, you know, this is a presentation about slideshows and um, because slideshows contain images, I wanna talk a little bit about the images ahead of time, that most of them in this slide deck are purely decorative. Um, they're really here for visual reinforcement and for fun. Um, all of the information um, in the images is in the slides or is in, is in, all of the information in the images is in my verbal content um, and redundant. Um, but if there is a, a picture that needs to be described, I'll be sure to do that. Um, we're in San Francisco, we're on Ohlone lands if you're joining us from San Francisco. Uh, my name is Amy June. Um, most of you know me. I work for Canopy Studios. I am the community source ambassador and QA engineer, and I help do a lot of different things. And Canopy is hiring to so lots of um, designer, uh, lots of creative roles. So if you know one, anyone who's looking for a creative position, uh, get a hold of us. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about what is accessibility, uh, kind of skim over some guidelines, some terms and definitions, but I really want to talk about some theoretical models of disability as well and how important they are when we talk about slideshows um, and assistive technology as well because when we don't have accessible slideshows, assistive techn technology users are the one that are affected the most. Um, so we're going to talk about slideshows and their components. We're going to talk a little bit about images, and then we'll kind of talk about all of it all together at the end. So we design for accessibility because it's the law, you know, um, that's sort of just one of those things. But we also want to make sure that we don't exclude people from using our products and services. Um, According to the CDC, 26% of people living in the United States live with a disability. Um, and that means um, that's about 70 million people, you know, that's 26%, that's one in four. So that could be um, possibly two of us here on this call, you know, so that's a lot of people. And being accessible means that everyone can access our product, you know, especially our written and our visual content. Um, we want to be really careful about the word inclusion because it's not about privileges to people. It's about making sure that the barriers to the information don't exist in the first part. And special needs is an ableist term. Um, special privileges, special needs. Um, accessibility is not a special need. It's a basic human right. And to be accessible really means to be inclusive. Website accessibility is an equality issue, you know, if you want to kind of boil it down. Um, and remember, as we get older, everyone becomes more disabled with time. Um, our hearing and our sight deteriorate. And then we need to think of situational disabilities as well. You know, um, when we think about, I kind of have this theme of Alice in Wonderland going here tonight. Alice grows small and tall and each one of those uh, physical characteristics brings some accessibility issues. Um, the white rabbit lives with anxiety disorder, you know, so he's preoccupied all the time with being late. We can think of the time when Alice shows up at the Duchess's house and no one can hear her, be, you know, she was trying to knock on the door, but there was so much commotion that no one can hear her. Um, or when she couldn't hear the words of the lullaby because of the baby crying. Um, for the sake of brevity, I just want to kind of glance over um, some terms and definitions. You know, there's the ADA, which is the American with Disabilities Act. Um, it prohibits uh, discrimination and it really ensures that everyone can participate in what we do every day here in America. It's about enjoying having a job, enjoying, you know, going to the store, participating in voting, um, making sure we can purchase goods and services. And this, um, the way it came about was really about like doing with state and local government. Um, Section 508 
uh, extends that a little bit more and it talks about procurement, you know, um, how to use information technology and make sure that it's accessible to people who live with disabilities. And this is regardless of people, um, if they work for the federal government or not. And to be 508 compliant means to be WCAG 2.0 compliant, which leads me to WCAG, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And this was this came um, this came about from the W3C, which is the World Wide Web Consortium, and it's really this shared series of documents that gives a standard for everybody. You know, um, throughout the world, lots of different countries, including the United States, reference these guidelines when establishing their own criteria about what it means to have digital accessibility. And then even further, WCAG is broken down into the A, the double A, and the triple A compliance. Um, double A is sort of this minimal compliance. If you're, or if, I don't know what I said, I think I said that wrong. The level A is minimal compliance. If your website doesn't meet this, it means that it's really hard for people who live with disabilities to use your website. Double A is acceptable compliance, which means that your website is usable and understandable by most people. And then AAA is this, you know, really optimal compliance. If your site is AAA compliant, it means that your website is accessible to the maximum number of users with or without disabilities. This AAA level really indicates the highest level of usability because accessibility is usability. And then there's POR, you know, which stands for perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Um, so, and then I break it down a little bit further and I talk about what the POR concepts are. So um, we want to make sure that we accommodate visual needs, um, you know, so we make it easy to see. Um, we want to make sure that we, um, that people can interact with our website so we accommodate any sort of motor issues that they might have, you know. Some people, are unable to operate a mouse. Some people are balancing a baby and only have one hand. Um, we wanna make sure that our websites um, accommodate auditory needs, you know, make it easy to hear, you know, or have a replacement, how I like to have captions and transcripts here um, during these, uh, these uh, visual presentations and audio presentations. And then the last one is making sure that it's easy to understand. and really we we take these four principles and make the experience as equal as possible across all of our websites and all of our digital assets and across platforms you know all of those things we have no control over you know operating system glare um size of hands all of those kinds of things so what's this theoret th theoretical model of disability um on the slide up here, I have the social model sort of highlighted because um, this is really the model I kind of talk about when I define accessibility. Um, but we have the medical model. This is where we see the disability as a problem that the person has. Um, it's it's caused by a medical condition. You know, it could be genetic disorder, a disease, you know, any sort of health issue. Um, and the medical model is said to be the main issue in the treatment of the disability is aimed at finding the cure. And then we have um, the biopsychological model, which recognizing that the disability is complex and incorporates both the medical and the social model. And I skipped the social model on purpose right now because I want to save that to the end. And then there's the economic model, which views the disability from the perspective of economics. You know, what impact does disability have on things like employment, welfare programs, the person, individual, society? You know, it really defines the person's disability by their inability to work. And this is why I like the social model. Instead of placing this, like labeling disability as a burden, you know, it looks at it a little bit further than that on this broader scale. It, that really disability and accessibility can 
be avoided because most of the time it's because we didn't design things right to begin with. So it comes down to universal design, you know. Um, and I have a quote that sort of highlights universal design a little bit. Um, and I'm just going to read it for ADA purposes. Um, it had snowed. A student waited in his wheelchair where the, while the janitor shoveled the front steps. The janitor said, I'll shovel the wheelchair ramp after I'm done with the steps. And then the student replied, if you clear the ramp first, then everyone can get in. So when I travel in Wonderland today, we're going to look specifically around the ideas of the social model and inclusive design, you know. Um, and when we talk about inclusive design, it's much like our outside world, you know, when it comes to our digital assets, the more inclusive we make our entryways and our ramps, you know, we lower our our drinking fountains, we widen our doors, the more usable the world is for everyone. And websites are no different. So assistive technology. Um, you'll sometimes see this abbreviated as AT. And it's really any sort of device or software or equipment that helps people work around challenges so they can learn, so they can communicate, and so they can function better. You know, these can be screen readers, speech input devices, keyboards. All of these are assistive technology. Um, but I also want to let people know that a mobile phone can be a form of assistive technology as well. And technology that allows and empowers users who live with low vision, you know, um, also empower users with cognitive and learning disabilities to access information too. You know, assistive technology really lowers that barrier to the internet and digital information for a lot of folks. WebAIM conducted a survey um, on, a, on screen readers to determine how and why people use screen readers. They found that almost 92% um, use a screen reader because they live with a disability. And of those 92%, 71% rely on the screen reader audio alone. And then that same survey, um, they found that respondents indicated that they're slightly more likely to use a mobile app than a website for common online tasks. So we have about 51 point, well, precisely 51.8% using a mobile device over 48% using um, a website. So that's something to think about as you build your as you build your widgets too. You know what? Uh, you know we're not just talking desktop anymore. We're going across into our mobile world too. Accessibility can be challenging, but it's not impossible. You know, once you start down that path of learning accessibility and really kind of building your empathy, it really opens your eyes to the needs of folks to be included, you know, and there's a quote from uh, the white queen that says why sometimes I believed as many six impossible things before breakfast. So we're here because of slideshows. So we'll, we'll get into slideshows. Um, you know, slideshows are usually predominantly located um, right there on our pages, you know, they're used to provide navigation or show page content. Uh, slideshows display, you know, a few items at a time. They're also called carousels or sliders. Um, some typical uses of slideshows might be uh, scrolling headlines, you know, across the top or bottom, you know, um, featured articles on home pages, stock tickers, um, image galleries. But according to the W3 schools, um, slideshows aren't very usable, you know, they're really disputed from a usability perspective because the content is hard to discover, you know, um, ensuring accessibility can also improve usability. Um, so I, we always joke around that the first rule of slideshows is not to use slideshows um, because they're next to useless for users and they're often skipped because they look like advertisements as well, especially on our little mobile phones. Um, and even for auto rotating carousels, research shows that the numbers of clicks on the slides after the initial slide drops off 
dramatically. Um, the survey, and I can't remember who did it, and I don't have it up on the slide, so I apologize. Um, they found that the click-through rate was rarely 1%, and then 84% 80 of those clicks were just on the first item of the rotation. Um, and there's a few different types of slideshows. We'll look at the most common ones. There's the basic slideshow. This has rotation, previous slide, um, next slide controls, and, but no slide picker controls. So you can see up here, there's a slideshow and you can see you know, each one of them is its own little section and there's, a, there's, a, there's an arrow uh, for navigation. So the slide is that single container the rotation control is the interactive element that stops and starts the rotations. You know, you have the next slide and the previous slide. You know, um, they help you with the ro with the with the rotation sequence. And then there's slide picker controls, which are, are a group of elements. And sometimes they're styled like little dots, or they can be the images themselves. And you can the user is able to pick a specific slide in the, the rotation. There's a tabbed slideshow. You know, this has those basic controls plus a single tab stop for slide picker controls. Um, a carousel pattern, you know, it, it's uh, based on the ARIA tab pattern. Only one tab panel is visible at a time and there's buttons to go back and forth or to play and pause the carousel. There's the grouped slideshow. These are like your basic controls plus a series of tab stops in the slide picker um, because each slide selector button adds an element to the page tab sequence. This style is the least friendly for our keyboard users. So that's something to think about too when we're, when we're looking at our accessibility of our slideshows is our keyboard users. So here's an image of that single content container within you know, a set of content containers. Here we can see I've highlighted um, the next or the previous arrow you can see. And you can also see that um, the forward arrow is highlighted on focus. It's not highlighted very well, but that's one of the things about an accessible slideshow is if our users who are using the keyboard know where their focus is. And I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, and then this slide has the ability to turn on and off the autoplay as well as multiple next and previous slides. And this one also is good because um, this particular slideshow is part of, a, of, a, of an audio slideshow. So it's got uh, sound controls, volume controls in the corner as well. And then slide picker controls, this is that group of elements um, you know, sometimes styled as the small image or styled as pictures underneath, and you're able to, to select the picture to go to that particular slide. So I wanna talk about um, the WCAG a little bit more and some of our success criteria around slideshows because it gets a little bit more specific when we talk about images. Um, so we're gonna talk about keyboard functionality. Um, we want to make sure that all of our functionality is available from the keyboard. You know, this means that folks that navigate that only using the keyboard, no mouse, they should be able to visit all of the links. They should be able to go to the images. They should open the slideshow and get out of the slideshow. We don't want people to have keyboard traps. And this really benefits people who are blind, you know, um, people who can't use devices like mice that uh, that require hand eye coordination. Uh, folks who live with low vision, you know, sometimes they have trouble finding or tracking the pointer on the indicator of the screen, so they use the keyboard. And then some people have hand tremors or palsies, so using a mouse is very difficult, that, and therefore they use the keyboard alone. And then we have uh, guidelines around seizures, 2.3. We don't want to design in a way that causes seizures. You know, uh, there are guidelines around flashes and animations, if your content moves around a lot, there needs to be a mechanism to turn that off. Um, and this set of success criteria benefit people who have seizures, you know, when they view fat, that flashing or quick moving material. Um, 
they want to be able to know that they won't have a seizure, you know, um, but they also don't want to uh, miss the full experience of the content by being limited to only having text alternatives, you know. This can include people who um, will have photosensitive epilepsy as well as photosensitive uh, seizure disorders or VIMS, that vision-induced motion sickness I always talk about at the, during the housekeeping um, of Doug. And then um, navigable. We want to make sure that we provide everyone uh, uh, a way to navigate and find the content and know where they are on the page. Um, so we talk about focus order, we talk about visible focus, you know. Our focus order is the order in which the keyboard tabs through the page. So the, this is also tabbing through your uh, slideshow content, you know, does the order make sense? And then visible focus is what allows the users to see where their cursor is at any certain time. So again, you know, um, you have a, an order that's goes through the page in a logical sequence, and then we want to be able to see where we are in that slideshow as well. Um, and this success criteria uh, benefits keyboard users who navigate you know, our slideshows sequentially, um, and they expect that focus order to be consistent with reading order. Uh, people with mobility impairments who rely on the keyboard, you know, people who have learning disabilities, they can sometimes become disoriented when tabbing focus happens someplace else, you know, and that it's unexpected where they are. Um, again, they benefit from that logical, consistent focus order. Uh, folks who have low vision or color blindness can sometimes become lost when tabbing uh, focus happens in an unexpected location. Um, People with attention limitations, you know, or short-term memory or process disorders can also benefit by being able to discover where the focus is. All kinds of people can, can really benefit from this navigable uh, success criteria. And then um, 2.55 talks about target size, and this is really important when we talk about mobile phones especially, you know, some of our mobile phones are getting really small. Um, so target size, you know, that region of the display port that will accept the pointer action, not only with your mouse, but with your finger as well. You know, these are interactive buttons or anchor links. Um, the size of the target for a pointer um, should be at least 44 by 44 uh, uh, CSS pixels. And this is a AAA success criteria, um, but in 2.2 and 3.0, this success criteria is, I think is moving into the AA. So I mention it because it might not be in the success criteria now, but it will be um, looking forward for your, for your slideshows to be compliant. And this benefits people who use a mobile device, you know, where the touch screen is the primary mode of interaction, um, users with uh, hand tremors, um, when we're on the train or the bus and our phones are shaking, you know, people who have difficulty with fine motor movements, uh, again, back to only using one hand for the device. Um, people who have large fingers, you know, um, it's really difficult to um, operate, you know, all those touch targets when they're really small. And then, you know, um, people who have low vision, you know, can better see that target when we're compliant. And just to clarify and repeat for importance, there are some musts you have to have to make your slideshows accessible. Um, provide the ability to turn the player off. You know, really make sure that those controls are accessible to the keyboard, mouse, and to touch, and provide those generous um, touch targets. Um, and back to those controls. We want to make sure that our controls are visible. You know, remember that size and color and take into account that background colors can change. You know, um, you can see, well, if you can see this uh, picture up here, we have Alice in sort of this gray beige tone, um, but our 
our our controls are sort of in this muted gray and they're really hard to see. You might be able to see that if we were going down the rabbit hole and the background was darker, but in this picture, you know, they're really hard to see. Um, we wanna make sure that our controls are highlighted on focus, you know, if we're using that keyboard. Um, and size and color really do matter. Um, do you need them on the image? You know, can you have them sort of off to the side? You know, think about that. You know, we have our designers and our and our content creators like with the this idea of what a slideshow is, but you know, sometimes some education about the buttons can really um, help with that usability. Um, we want to make sure that we provide a reasonable alternative and experience if maybe folks can't access those images, not only with the screen reader, but maybe we have our images turned off in our CSS, you know, maybe we have our images turned off because of data roaming, all of those different kinds of things, you know. So you really have to think about if you turn off your images, are you still being able to convey all of the information to your content consumers? Um, you can see here, there's a bunch of just empty boxes. So CSS is turned off on this slideshow, but there's no text alternative. So we have no idea what those images are trying to tell us. And some more tips, you know, on ways to increase our slideshow accessibility, you know, be sure our slide changes are announced through a screen reader, you know, that we're changing slides, um, display our controls and our captions above or below the image, you know, the controls and captions are easier to perceive and to sort of um, navigate without all that background noise. Um, we have a CSS media feature called prefers reduced motion. You know, this is used um, to determine or detect if our user has requested that our their browsers or their system minimize the amount of non-essential motion it uses. Um, Internet Explorer is the only browser that does not support this feature. And then again, you know, training our content authors and our creators on all of our images best practices, which leads me into images because a big part of our content for slideshows is images. Um, and we love images, you know, They're, they enhance our content. And especially for people who live with cognitive or learning disabilities, you know, we include images and uh, media that support and add to our content and information as well. You know, we have those charts and we have the diagrams. Um, people who live with low vision use images to help orient themselves on the page as well. And then media, um, including and maybe especially social media, use images for conversions, you know. So having images on posts uh, Twitter feeds, you know, in our blog articles or in our newsletters really leads to a higher click through rate and return on investment. So this is a little success criteria heavy, but there's success criteria around images as well. Um, and this all goes back to that um, perceivable. Remember, we talked about the poor, the, the perceivable, operable, understandable and robust. A lot of the success criteria around uh, images has to do with perceiving them, you know. Um, so there's non-text content. We want to make sure that all non-text content is presented to the user that and it has a text alternative, you know. Um, again, making that experience as equivalent as possible. Um, if we have images of text, you know, technologies, we want to make sure that Existive technologies uh, can achieve the visual presentation, you know, text that's conveyed um, in our images. Um, we have to make sure that it's conveyed um, textually as well, because uh, seeing the image isn't going to do anyone any good. And then we have um, why it's important, you know. Um, 
again, it goes back to people using assistive technology, you know, people using screen readers, you know, the text alternative is read aloud or rendered as braille if someone has like a refreshable braille display. Uh, people using speech input devices, you know, users can put focus on a button or a linked image with a single um, voice command. Text alternatives can be read aloud um, for people browsing speech-enabled websites, you know, mobile web users. Uh, the images can be turned off, especially for those, you know, poor internet connection or data roaming. And then again, search engine optimization. Once our images are turned into text, now they're indexable by our, our search engines. Um, text alternatives really support the ability to search for that non-text content and repurpose our content in a, in, a, in a few different ways. And there's um, a lot of different image types. I'm only gonna talk about a few of them tonight. Um, it's simple, complex images of text, groups of images and image maps. Um, but there's other things like CAPTCHAs and functional images. Um, and we'll look at all of these a little closer in the next few slides. There's our simple image, you know, this conveys simple image and, you know, um, alt text for these is generally a short, sweet description of the content. Um, and it's typically invisible to our sighted friends, um, but it's exposed to people who are using that assistive technology like screen readers or those uh, refreshable braille displays. Um, and the description should convey the content and functionality of the image as concisely as possible to provide access to the content, but we don't want to give a ton of details. You know, um, we would do something like for this image, a tree in front of a chessboard uh, countryside in Wonderland. We have complex images. These can be charts, they can be graphs, um, diagrams, infographics, um, and these contain too much information to really be described using alt text. Um, so sometimes we use long description. Um, I'm not going to go into the caveats of long description now, but it's not supported in HTML5. So um, you really think of, you really have to think about the way you use long description these days. But it's a more detailed description that provides that equivalent access to the information on the page. Again, you know, given the current context, what information is the image intended to communicate? That same information must be provided to people who can't see it. You know, you can include structure necessary to communicate the content of the image. You know, you can include headings, lists, data tables. So this image, I might say, um, Alice in the middle with paths to other characters through Wonderland. And I describe where the arrows were going and what text is underneath each of the images. And then you wanna make sure that when you describe these complex images that you do it in a sequential way that makes sense too. Decorative images, these are purely decorative. They don't convey any information and you can mark them as decorative. Um, images that are decorative can be styling like borders, like what we see here. They can be spacers, they can be corners. They could be illustrative text, but not contributing any information. Um, they also could maybe be identified and described by the text around them too, like a caption or you know a paragraph um, describing the image. But I'm all about inclusion and making sure everyone has the same experience. Um, so some people think decorative images um, is a little bit more broad, but if you use an image to convey emotion or mood, it is not decorative. If you use an image to convey emotion or mood, you should describe it because if you don't, those people who don't have that content are really missing out on some valuable feelings. Um, images of text, this is readable text presented within the image itself. Um, if images of text are used, you want to make sure that the text alternative contains exactly the same words as in the image. Um, but with this, using actual text is way more flexible than using an image of text. Um, real, you know, actual text can be resized without losing clarity. The background colors, the text colors can be changed to suit your content consumers needs. Um, 
And then, you know, if we have images of text, when we zoom in and we zoom out of them, they can get really distorted. Um, so we have an image um, up here with some, with some text in it. So I would say something like, Alice looking at the Cheshire cat smile with the words curiouser and curiouser in the background. Again, you want to uh, be verbatim with what words are in the image. And we have groups of images. This is text alternative for one image, should really convey the information um, for the entire group. Um, most of the time, this is like something like a star rating. You know, uh, this group of five stars combined shows one rating. Um, there are two and a half, two stars filled all the way in, one star filled halfway, and then two empty stars. So I would use the first image and I would say, 2.5 out of five stars. And then all of those other images I would leave empty, you know, or null, you know, quote, quote. So, you know, that again, the text alternative for the, for the whole image should be in that first image. And some bonus um, material. The, these aren't things that you normally find in slideshows, but we're talking about images and I, I just like people to know about them. Um, image maps, groups of images, CAPTCHAs, and functional images. Again, these aren't ones you find in, in, um, in typical slideshows, but um, it's kind of uh, the same as our uh, non-text content, of course, but we also have some additional criteria around functional images. Um, link purpose, um, this is important because we often see our, we see pagination as images, we see um, image links, and we really have to think about uh, the alternative text around that, not only explaining what the image is, but the purpose of each of the links. Uh, where does the link go? Um, what button does it engage? You know, so there's a, that additional success criteria if it's a linked image or if it's a functional image. Um, on here is a picture, you know, functional image, um, and some examples of functional images can be um, logos. You know, often we have our logos in the corner of our pages that link out to someplace else. You know, we have a logo image with uh, link text. We have icon images conveying information within the link text. You know, these can be things like, you know, like printer pictures or opens to a PDF. Um, and we also have images that can be used as buttons as well. Um, image maps, um, these contain multiple clickable areas. These are organizational charts. These are park maps. These are decision trees. The text alternative for this image um, has that additional success criteria as well. You know, um, you should provide the overall uh, information for the the whole picture but then you also need to describe what each individual clickable area does um, so this image we might be doing something like alice's path through wonderland and then we would describe where each one of those um, pin links goes in captchas um, these are tricky um, again we don't see these in slideshows but um, they basically confirm whether or not we're human um, the visual or video captcha uh, really is just a challenge to see if we're human, you know, make it harder for machines to get into our sites. Um, a visual captcha cannot contain um, alt text by design, if you think about it, because it would give the machine the answer. Um, that's why we have the, the captcha to begin with. Um, so we always want to provide alternative options like an audio or a one-time password for our CAPTCHAs, you know. Um, requiring two different forms of CAPTCHA ensures that most people with disabilities will find a form that they can use, you know. But there needs to be a message to let those folks know, you know, those who rely on text that there's an alternative available. Um, and I did a little bit of research um, the other day and Google has options um, being reCAPTCHA and reCAPTCHA version 2. Um, so be sure to explore all the options available and be sure that a person 
who's using assistive technology isn't left behind and not even being able to get to your site. And then media players, because sometimes we see these um, slideshows in our media players. When we choose how to deliver our material, it's really important to consider that everything's accessible. You know, um, whether you're selecting a media plugin or a module um, or selecting a service to host your images. You know, there's questions you need to ask yourself. Can the player, um, are there buttons and controls? Um, can they be operated without a mouse? Back to that keyboard or switch functionality. Um, are the media buttons and controls labeled so that they can be operated by a blind person using a screen reader? Is the media player fully functional, including all of its accessibility features across platforms and in all major browsers? So, you know, we sometimes, you know, have this YouTube embed on our sites, but when people come down into mobile, now it might not be accessible anymore. Um, so just for fun, I want, you know, we traveled through Wonderland and I kind of wanted to make the analogies here. What lessons did we learn? Um, we learned that not all descriptions are equal. We want to make sure that we clarify the purposes of our images. You know, we have these WCAG guidelines and they're sort of this one size fits all guideline for authoring our descriptions. But we really need to keep in mind that the descriptions really need to be relevant and responsive to the context in which an image is found, you know. Um, so an image like this, you know, um, they say drink me and eat me, you know, Alice could have really benefited from labels on things that she ate or drink, right? So it's all about context. It's not about special privileges, or accessibility overlays, or going off site to another website. It's about making sure that there's no barriers that exist in the first place. Again, special privileges, that's not okay. We wanna make it as equitable for everyone as we can. And if possible, we wanna make sure that our elements aren't subject to a time limit. You know, we wanna, we wanna really allow our users to use our media at their own pace. If there's a time limit, there needs to be like for security or something, you know, the user should have the option to turn it off or extend it. Um, and this goes with our media players as well. You know, if we don't have that stop or pause, sometimes the content goes too fast for some of our consumers, you know. Uh, the white rabbit is always so nervous about time. Imagine their anxiety as they're going through a slideshow that they can't stop and pause. So I have a whole nother talk about cross-functional teams with accessibility, but um, if developers take the time to learn code and design best practices, really accessibility is a best practice as well. You know, if we take the time to build it right, from the start, it actually saves us money, you know? So we need to make sure that us as developers and coders, you know, that we keep up to pace with accessibility standards and success criteria, um, you know, keeping up with the latest JavaScript frameworks and coding standards, you know? It's all the same sort of stuff, you know, build it into your professional development and your learning time. Going back and fixing something that could have been correctly done from the beginning is way more expensive, you know? And it comes down to accessibility being a usability factor as well. You know, making sure that our sites are fully accessible to our users means that there's fewer bounces, you know, um, better conversion rates. It really does lead to that better return on investment. You know, um, better usability is not only good for users, but it's good for your performance and your SEO rankings, you know. Um, and I have this cute picture. I actually have the painting. I Oh, it's covered up. But um uh, here's the playing cards, you know, they lost their head by trying to fix the roses by painting them red when they should have just had red roses from the start. And Google is very clear that we need focus speed and user experience through usability. And remember when I mentioned compliance level, I briefly mentioned that greater accessibility equals better usability for all users. 
and carousels don't fit into that plan. Um, so do we replace them? You know, I want to go back to that slide with about the click through rates, you know, um, remember, uh, that study said that there was a click through rate of barely 1% and only 84% of those clicks were on the first item in the rotation. So there's a couple of big questions to ask ourselves when we think about these carousels and these slideshows is, are we gonna take the plunge and remove or discontinue using carousels? You know, what do you put in their place? And it really depends, you know. Um, it would depend on the type of website you have. The simple solution would be maybe to um, have a single static banner on your website, you know, that has a single feature and perhaps some smaller features underneath. Remember, people generally just look at that first item anyway. You know, um, this allows the visitor to view the information they're looking at much quicker. And it also reduced page time loads, you know. For e-commerce sites, a popular choice is now to include a load more function with Ajax functionality, um, so there's not a delay in loading. And then the King of Hearts told us, you know, you begin at the beginning and you go on till you come to the end and then stop. But that's not the case with accessibility because um, accessibility is always a moving target. And that's something to think about. Yeah. Yes, you know, some of us are coders and designers and we've coded and we've designed our websites for accessibility. But after we're done, we hand it off to our stakeholders or we hand it off to our content authors and they add content. So it's really important to revisit our websites often, you know, um, make sure that we test over time, you know, um, again, we move forward, accessibility into our meeting, into our built, and then we remediate any challenges, which leads me into roles and responsibilities. And I promise you there's not that much left. I know we're coming up on time. Um, so roles and responsibilities of the life cycle people are assigned roles all the time you know there's the front end developers there's back end developers there's qa people there's product owners there's editors and we really need to make sure that we give all of our roles accessibility responsibilities um if the accessibility discussion starts with the wireframes and the discovery then the developers and the designers can weigh in at the same time and then there's not much left when there's stakeholder handoff and then we need to really empower our designers and the people doing our research and even the people ideating on our sites to have accessibility in mind when they think about these carousels that they want on the sites or anything, you know, because again, fixing an issue in production is so much more complicated than if it would have just been addressed in the design phase. Um, there's a new set of guidelines um, called the accessibility roles and responsibility mappings. And I'm not gonna get into those, but there's they've come up with these sort of like blanket roles that they're created to kind of share with us that we can build upon. Um, you know, they talk about authoring roles, uh, uh, vision roles, uh, QA and user experience roles. Um, but what I got from this and I have the the link to this page in the resources is, is if we start and we have these roles and responsibilities, especially at that buy-in level, our CEOs and our product owners, and they learn about accessibility and they learn about functionality and we kind of convince them that slideshows aren't the greatest thing, it kind of trickles down. So everyone is, is, is aware of our accessibility um, patterns and needs. You know, so working with the team, creating style sheets and style guides that people can go off of. You know, if you have one successful accessible slideshow, you can kind of take that from project to project. Uh, we train our content authors on alternative text best practices. Um, we remember that accessibility is a moving target, that we should go back and we should test for accessibility every few months. And this isn't only as content is created, but it's as as our assistive technology changes and expands as well, you know, we're constantly innovating how how people interact with our websites. You know, our platforms are changing, our our browsers are changing, you know. So so remember that it's all dynamic. 
And with that, I am done. Um, I talk a lot, so um, I was planning on 40 minutes, but of course it didn't do that. So um, thank you for letting me practice. Is there any questions? Are there any questions, I guess, is the right grammar for that? Um, I have, I don't know if it's a question or discussion, uh, sure. but where like the the first uh, recommendation of start with not using <laughs> them and it's almost like it's even as a developer, this comes to me as if they're a designer for some reason decided that this is a good idea. And I think in my experience, like accessibility is cheaper the sooner we take care of things. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if you have a uh, ways yeah. or materials for designers to know about, I guess, so, the same slideshow. So sometimes people will ask me, like, is there an accessible slideshow? Like, is there a widget or something like that? And I found two that are kind of neat. Um, one being Able Player, it's really accessible. And then one of them being through Accessibility Oz. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that company, but she's got, Gian Wild has, um, some great slideshows and great accessibility materials on GitHub that people can take and modify, you know. Um, but it does come down to like at Canopy, we talk a lot about accessibility at the design phase. And just the other day, someone posted something in the design channel that said, hey, designers, remember X, Y, and Z. And one of the designers says, oh, that's right. I do need to remember X, Y, and Z. So it's a lot of like, I think like just sort of like, making sure that everyone's involved in the conversation, especially our stakeholders, because they're the ones that want the slideshow to begin with, you know, most of the time. <laughs> I admit, like, when I first got into web development, I wanted this huge web, you know, slideshow because it looked really neat. And then as I learned, I'm like, ooh, no. I'm just amazed at, like, the, the, the numbers about how the click-through rate isn't that great you know that it drops off anyway so what's the point you have this great except for when it comes to like like uh destination websites like weddings and things like that those are when we see that people like will click through the the slideshows or like real estate things or car slideshow but when we're just using it sort of as like this decoration across the page um most of the content isn't even um click through Would you have links for the uh, tools you recommended? I think I was able to find Able Player, and I'm not sure I found Accessibility Oz. Um, me and Herschel were just looking at this yesterday. The one I know of was a slick carousel derivative where they fork that and made investment on accessibility. And as far as I know, I saw that the Drupal module is now supporting that version as well. Okay. I didn't know that. I didn't test it yet. But there's a link to her article and then at the top of the article to the GitHub repository. And I sent it to Irina. Uh, so let me send it to the channel. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. I shared the one that I found before. Well, yeah, <clears throat> it's great to think about those different types of users, right? Like you were mentioning and people with just anxiety or, you know, autism or just some other cognitive disabilities or anything just stressing them out you know um so yeah just putting that all even dyslexia right so those slideshows yeah are a, a big distraction. i know uc santa barbara actually kind of made a decision to get away from of course there's still departments that need them they 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 can't stay away they, they love the slideshows right uh, <laughs> but yeah thank you for this uh, presentation and all the great words about accessibility you're welcome eric Do you have, uh, Amy, uh, um, 
examples of successful slideshows on uh, websites? I do, maybe. I'm on my personal computer, so let's see. I don't have the same bookmarks. Um, let me, it might take me one minute to, because I have to log in. Okay, so this is from W3C, it's kind of your basic one, and then DeQ has one as well, and I based some of my slides on these. And I don't know if you've seen this one, but um, <laughs> this one's kind of fun. The, should I use a slideshow? <laughs> Just basically, you know. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> I'm going to stop 